as a geologist on the Mosul Dam Task Force, a project by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers designed to repair and stabilize the Mosul Dam in Iraq. Mr. Shannon's talk is titled Careers in Ecology, uh, Geology and Environmental Science. So please give me a hand. Okay, first I'd like to uh, introduce myself. My name is John Shannon. I'm a geologist at AECOM. It's a multinational design consultation engineering firm. I'm located in the Providence office, Providence, Rhode Island. Right now, as Russell said, I'm working, um, I just got back from working in Mosul, Iraq, on the Mosul Dam. So first I want to talk a little bit about uh, careers in geology and environmental science. And then I'm going to tell you about the job that I'm working on, which is working on what has been called the world's most dangerous dam. So careers in environmental science. I went to, for my bat, um, bachelor's degree, I got a geology degree from the University of Buffalo. And then many years later, I went back um, to get my master's in environmental science and management from the University of Rhode Island. They had um, six tracks in the environmental science program that you could take like a set of core classes and then kind of branch out into the different tracks. So I'm talking about careers in environmental science. I'm just going to go over kind of the tracks they had and what some of the people that I went to school with did with their degrees. So there's environmental planning and design. Right now, um, as you know, there's a lot of environmental regulations that are in effect. So if you want to build a shopping mall or even, even your home, you want to expand on it, there are environmental regulations as far as how close can you get to a wetland. Um, if you have too much impermeable surface, such as a parking lot, you have to have detention basins for the water that runs off the parking lot. So there's a lot that you have to design for to meet those requirements. So a degree in environmental planning and design, you can work as a in a design firm such as AECOM, a lot of towns have planning departments where somebody could work with the environmental planning department. Another track was the environmental policy and management, which is, it's a government track mostly where you go and you learn environmental policy where you put those regulations on houses or farms or industry or um, development. Also, a lot of companies will have an environmental policy component because they have to meet these regulations and to have somebody <coughs> on their side that knows the policy is uh, very important. Myself, where I worked, we had to, um, my first job was in Rhode Island working on National Grid was building an extension to their transmission line. So they had wetland regulations. The line went from Douglas, Massachusetts into Rhode Island across Rhode Island, then into Connecticut. So you're crossing multiple jurisdictions, multiple states. You have, every town has a conservation bylaw, what they want you to do with their wetland. There are state environmental regulations for wetlands, and there's federal environment, environmental regulations for wetlands. So it gets complicated. So they really need somebody on hand to go through all the permits. You gotta get permits for every town, every wetland crossing, every stream crossing. So it's an involved field, and, and that's one of the tracks that they had in URI. Conservation biology is also like a conservation agent. People work to preserve biodiversity. I know in Rhode Island, one of the students was working on the, I think it was the Easton cottontail. It was a type of rabbit that's going extinct. People think, oh, you know, have a field and it's fine. Have a woods or it's fine. But some animals, and I'm pretty sure this is right for the cottontail, they need a little bit of field and a little bit of woods, because they go into the field to feed, but they need to run back into the woods to be safe and to burrow. So it's, it's, it's complicated to figure out what actually is needed to keep the biodiversity. Some species require a large bit of land to range, others require small pieces, so that's something that a conservation biologist would deal with. We had a nice remote sensing and spatial analysis group, which is uh, GIS, you guys familiar with GIS, Geographic Information Systems? Basically, um, it's mapping where you have different layers on the map, and one layer, like you can go online now and do all these maps where you could get your town, overlay the wetlands, 
and overlay the transmission lines. And you see right where the transmission lines go through it. That's something that we dealt with. Spatial analysis is actually using, part of it was infrared sensors from satellites where they would fly over the land and they would map the infrared signature of the landscape. And you could tell by the signature what was there. So in an aerial photograph, you can look and you can see trees and fields. The infrared um, analysis can tell you, is that artificial turf or is that grass? Because they're gonna give a different heat signature. Obviously, if you guys play an artificial turf, you know how hot it can get. Grass is gonna absorb that heat. So they're gonna have, and plus the chemicals that are involved, they're gonna have a different signature that's bouncing back that the satellites can uh, interpret. <coughs> Wetland, watershed, and ecosystem science. This is, I was involved in part of this. Wetlands, very important. Um, over 50% of the wetlands in the US are gone since in the last 200 years. Wetlands, people fill them in. They were swamps, they were mires. Let's fill them in, let's build towns. Boston, they filled in all of the, um, the harbor and the back bay was a bay. Filled it all in, they built houses on it. What that does is now when you have heavy rains, the water has nowhere to go, so you have flooding. You have a lack of biodiversity, you have lack of species lose their connectivity, so they can't get from one part of town to the other maybe, and then they lose their habitat. So wetlands are very important. Watershed science is important for flooding because you have a whole watershed. Um, it might not be raining here, not, not so much here, but in a mountainous region, it might not be raining down here, but if it's raining in the mountains, that watershed is filling up with water, and it's all funneling down to a central point. Um, New Orleans is a good example of that. It's the end of the Mississippi watershed, and we all know how much New Orleans has problems with floods. I was mainly in the earth and hydrologic science for my master's degree. I basically specialize in hydrogeology. Um, we did a lot of remediation classes. If you, the first thing our teacher had us do was go to a website and type in your town. So I'm from Mansfield, Massachusetts. So it starts to show you, here's a contaminated site. Here's another one. Here's another, another, another. So in this area where there's been industry for the last 200 years, there's metal plating, there's um, tanneries. Back then, there were no environmental regulations, per se. People would dump their chemicals into the stream. They would just wash the residue of the manufacturing process right into the water, or just dump it on the ground. Now, years later, people have houses there, people have schools there, and they're finding out that the land is contaminated. So new um, people move in, they have to fix that land. One of the projects my company has is in Mansfield at a church parking lot. The land is contaminated. The system is called a pump and treat. So exactly what it is, we pump the water out of the ground, we treat it through carbon filters and some other filters to get the contaminants out. So basically at one side of the property, we are pumping the water out and then the pipes bring it back to this side and pump the clean water back in and we're kind of flushing the contaminant through the site to, to clean it up at the other end. Geology careers, there's a lot of overlap. And all those six, and in these six I'm about to talk about, there's a lot of overlap. So you don't need to be pigeonholed. Mining industry, obviously geology is important in that. Where are the metals? Not only that, but once you're there, what's the best way to access the metals? There's plenty of metals that we know where they are. It just costs too much to get them out. So knowing where it is is one thing, but unless, you, unless it's easy and accessible, it might not be economically viable to get it out. Environmental geology is what I'm involved in. Superfund sites was a fund created to clean up toxic wake sites all over the US. Um, there is, I'm sure there's probably one in Sharon, there's one in Mansfield, they're all over the place. And you'll just see a fence up, past that property every day, you don't know what's there, well, there's probably some bad stuff in the ground. And if it's being treated, hopefully they're containing it. Geotechnical and engineering geology, I'm working with a lot of people in that field right now. That's a picture of the Oroville Dam. I'm sure you guys all heard about that. It was in the news recently. The, they built it, and there was, this, there was a shear zone going through the rocks in this area. They weren't aware of how it would react. So when the dam, when they released the water over the spillway, 
there was leaks in it, there was water going underneath it, it was eroding out from underneath, and it was eroding out through the shear zone where the rocks kind of gave way, which led to the collapse of the spillway, and led to the erosion up the side, which was threatening to breach the dam and release the whole, uh, the whole reservoir downstream. As far as environmental policy, they, they only had a worst case scenario evacuation policy in effect. So they, that's the only policy they had, that's the policy they had to use. So they over evacuated, you know, I forget how many tens of thousands or 100,000 people downstream. So that led to, obviously that's a big inconvenience for everybody, people were very upset about that. So that's something that they have to review now, that's an Army Corps of Engineer dam. They have hundreds of them all over the countries in various states of disrepair. So that's something that environmental policy we have to review. What are our contingency plans? What are our evacuation plans? And do they meet the, uh, what actually might happen at that site? A government nonprofit, uh, the U.S. Geological Survey is a federal agency. Also lots of states will have a state geologist. And they, um, it's a big data repository is, is part of what that is where they'll create the geological maps of the different states, they'll create the watershed maps, they have really good um, online tools now where you can go to your house, find out where your watershed is, so you know exactly like where your water is coming from. Um, I'm part of the Canoe River Aquifer Advisory Committee. Um, the five towns are Sharon, Mansfield, Foxborough, and Easton, and Norton, we all share the Canoe River Aquifer. So a lot of people in those five towns get water from that aquifer. So what happens in Sharon goes to Foxborough, which goes to Mansfield, which goes to Easton and Norton. So we all have to work together to make sure that everybody's protecting that uh, resource. Petroleum industry is um, oil and natural gas. Um, there's like, we heard a lot about the um, shale oil recently with all the natural gas in Pennsylvania and New York. But right now, the price of oil is at a, is at a pretty low rate. So um, the tar sands oil in Canada, it's not really economically viable right now to get that oil out of the ground. When it, back when it was 80, 90, $100 a barrel, you can get those um, hard to reach sites and oil that needs a lot of refining. Now that it's $30 a barrel, it's gonna cost you more to get that oil out of the ground, refine it, than it is than you're going to make on the open market. And teaching in academia, this is a picture of uh, one of the best parts about geology. You go on a lot of field trips, and mine was out in Wyoming and Utah and Colorado, and you spent a week out in the field and you did geological mapping, and it was like real world uh, experience. Okay. So my current job is working on what's called the most dangerous dam in the world. It's the Mosul Dam, and in terms of internal erosion potential of the foundation, Mosul Dam is the most dangerous dam in the world. If a small problem occurs, failure is likely. That's from a U.S. Army, a US Army Corps of Engineers report in 2006. It's 11 years later, and we're finally getting to work on it because obviously that area um, has a lot of um, issues, to say the least. So there's been plenty of articles in the papers about it where the Army warns of a dam catastrophe. It's at high risk of failure. That's from 2016. Catastrophic failure of a Mosul Dam. New York had a really good article. Is the Iraqi Dam a bigger problem than ISIS? And this is one of my favorites. Mosul Dam collapse will be worse than a nuclear bomb. This article came out while I was actually over there and my family and friends emailed me and like, what's up with this article? So the problem with the dam is, here's a map. Um, the Mosul Dam is up here. This is uh, Lake the Hook, which was created by the dam. Mosul's down here. It's about 25 kilometers as the crow flies. It's in northern, northern Iraq. The dam was actually captured by ISIS militants in 2014. But uh, the main problem with the dam, let's start from the beginning, is that it, hold on. It's built on soft, dissolved, dissolvable gypsum and hydrite and carcified limestone bedrock. Carcified limestone is limestone that has caves. So basically they built it on rock that not only dissolves in water, prone to having caves, and um, it can't support the, the dam. 
So it was a horrible place to build a dam. The dam itself was actually well made, just built in a geologically worse spot that it could possibly be built in. So what they did from day one, part of the plan was to build a gallery through the base of the dam, stretching across the valley, where they would continuously, since 1985, six days a week, 24 hours a day, pump cement into the voids under the dam. So they've been drilling and grouting, they've been using grout, for over 30 years to basically fill up those cavities and stop the dam from collapsing in on itself. So the foundation has been severely eroded by water. Um, the solution to this erosion has been the constant mass scale grouting under the dam. And the US Army Corps of Engineers study reported that the bedrock foundation will collapse from just the weight of the dam and the water erosion. So the projected loss of life from a total failure of the dam is anywhere from 500,000 to one and a half million people. There would be a wall of water about 75 feet high would hit the city of Mosul in about four hours of dam failure, and the flood waters would reach Baghdad within 38 hours. Flooding would cause an enormous loss of life and property. 38 hours seems like a lot of time. If you knew that the dam collapsed then, and if you had an evacuation plan in place, Baghdad, this is not on their radar. The people living in Baghdad, working in Baghdad, this is not something that they're thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis. The American Embassy in the Green Zone is on the Tigris River. That's the river that flows through the dam. If the dam was to break, our embassy would be underwater. A lot of American soldiers would be at risk, not only during the catastrophe, but afterwards, because we'd have to go in, because it'd be a humanitarian disaster, and America being in the region already would, would respond, putting possibly more soldiers and aid workers at risk. So preserving this dam, maintaining it, stabilizing it, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers felt that it was an important project. So, there's a picture of the Mosul Dam. Part of it, that's not even the whole thing. It's over three kilometers long, including the uh, fuse plug. The white building on the left with the four towers, that is the power plant. If you can see, it says Mosul Dam Project across the base of it. And this is a geological map of the project site. You can see this is the original channel of the Tigris River, and this is the dam stretching across all the way over to here. So this is the earthen, earthen fill dam. Okay. So part of the problem is that it's built on anhydrite and gypsum. Now anhydrite, CaSO4, when, it, when it's in water, it will swell to become gypsum. When it becomes gypsum, it'll swell 30 to 50 percent larger. So you can picture layers of rock. The anhydrite layer is now in water, so it's becoming gypsum, it's swelling. So it's pushing up the rock above it. It's cracking the rock above it and below it as it turns into gypsum. Once it becomes gypsum, it's 100 times more soluble than limestone. So now we have rock that's swirling, now that's dissolving. So what that leads to is, so you'll see that the swelling will crack the rock above it. Then the, the gypsum below it starts to dissolve and create voids and pockets and fissures and cracks. The rock above it now is broken and cracked. It'll fall into that and it'll create sinkholes. This is the photo I took over there. That's my sunglasses for scale. This is a, a conglomerate layer very well cemented. This is the gypsum limestone layer. As this starts to dissolve, this well cemented <coughs> conglomerate stays intact because it's, it's well cemented. So you can have a void underneath it and you wouldn't know and it could just get bigger and bigger and bigger until it finally the expanse of the cavern gets large enough that the roof can no longer support it and then it collapses in. At that point you could have a pretty big hole under your dam. This is pictures taken during the building of the dam. So they, you, they can see the dissolution features. These are, this is a cement truck down here, a pickup truck. These are cavities, caves, cracks, fissures, sinkholes that they found in, during construction of the dam. This was a problem that they knew was there when they built it. This is a picture, this is just off to the left of the dam. This area is mostly 
I think the water level is about up to here now. This was taken in October when the reservoir has drawn down over the, over the uh, winter months. The, the rains came later and filled it back up. These are just like buoys that they pull out into the, into the lake. But you can see the, the limestone here and the, and the marl gypsum beds, very pockmarked, very cracked, very fissured, all broken up. This is what um, a lot of the dam is built on. Okay, these are some of the as-built drawings, some of the engineering drawings of the dam. <coughs> Excuse me. So you can see right here is called the clay core of the dam. The clay core is an impermeable clay core. And then they just piled um, rock. Uh, this is dirt fill here and the rock fill. So it's an earthen core dam, so it's very wide base to hold back the water. The dam itself is um, it's about 300, 300 something feet tall, like 100 meters tall. The, the lowest level of the water is 300 meters above sea level. The highest is 330 meters above sea level. It's been at 319 for a long time because as the water level increases, the amount of pressure against the dam increases. But the Iraqis need the power generated by the dam. So they have been pushing to raise the water level. So right now, I think it's at, when I left, I think it was at 320, and it was starting to go down because they'd already passed the heavy rains. They use the water for irrigation. They use the water for power generation and to, to maintain flows in the Tigris River downstream throughout the year. This is the geological cross-section of the geology under the dam. This is the left abutment. This is very confusing. It's, uh, I learned this on this project. Whenever you're talking about dams, imagine yourself standing on the dam looking downstream. That's the right side, that's the left side. Every picture we see of this dam, you're looking upstream at it because you're looking north. So it's very confusing. So when you're looking at the pictures, it's usually reversed. So this is, <clears throat> this is the original valley of the cross section of the valley. This is the gray, the actual, sorry, the ground is the actual dam. This gray here is called the grouting gallery. It's the tunnel that they built in place and then built the dam on top around it. So these are some of the layers. Some of the blue layers is the gypsum breccia layers. Those are the layers that are dissolving the most. In between those are layers of limestone, limestone breccia malls. There's some limestone up here. This is actually hard rock up here. Some of these areas where you tur it turns to the reddish color is where we've had the most uh, dissolution. So that's where the most voids are going to be. This is the middle, the valley section. Actually, yeah, I'm working right in this section right now, which is basically the old riverbed of the Tigris River. That's where the Tigris River was. And we're having a lot of issues there because that's where there's been water there for the whole time the river's been there. This is the right above it as it comes up. Right here is two outfall tunnels that are built under the dam. And pictures of those later. These are the four intakes for the, four or five intakes for the power plant. They're just tunnels drilled from one side of the dam to the other. So this is how I arrived at base camp. We flew commercial flight into Erbil, Iraq. From there, we had to get a military helicopter to take us from the airport to the base camp. I left in October of last year, which if you remember, that was the time of the assault on Mosul began. Uh, you can see some fires in the distance. That's, that's some fires that were in Mosul at the time. Uh, that's me. That's that's my, my Halloween costume. That's Halloween at the base camp. So that's an Italian military vehicle because the company that's doing the engineering work is an Italian company called Trevi. The Italian army is the main force that's protecting us at this base camp. That's the body armor that they were issued to us, which we don't have to wear with us all the time, but we do have to have it in our vehicles and in, in our rooms with us. This is a picture of the base camp as we were coming in that night. That's the Tigris River in the background. And another picture of the base camp taken from one of the nearby hills. There was nothing there really but before they started this project. They built a little mini city to support the project. 
Okay, about the job itself. Um, I'm a big fan of safety first. Uh, in every industry, you have to be safe. Um, some of you might even work part-time jobs. Um, a lot of injuries happen to college students, I mean, high school students on their part-time jobs because they don't know about safety. They're not trained on safety, so just be aware. On this project, we have English speakers, we have an Italian army, an Italian engineering firm, we have the local Arabic workers. We are also actually in a part of Iraq called Kurdistan. So a lot of the people there speak Kurdish, slightly different than Arabic. Um, one of the subcontractors doing the drilling speak Turkish. There were also some Filipino people doing the grouting software. And we also have an Australian with us, and he's sometimes the most difficult one to understand. <laughs> so those are all different ways of saying safety first. Don't come Augusta means don't hurt yourself. He's our, actually our safety and security um, project lead, and he'll give a speech, and you have to like, what did that mean? What is that word? I don't know what that is. Is um, graphics, so easy to understand in any language. Hard hat, safety vest, safety glasses, ear protection when needed, and steel toe boots. All that is a priority. We've had, and I dealt with this years ago as a security guard, and you deal with this. I deal with it on this job. Somebody will show up. You don't have a hard hat on. It's okay, I don't need one. No, you really need a hard hat. No, no, I'm the head of the Ministry of Water Resources. They run the dam, they own the dam. Still gotta tell the guy, you cannot come on the job without a hard hat. So then I get a complaint made to my boss saying, they're not letting me on the job. My boss looks at me and say, good job, you did the right thing. Because I don't care who you are, you're on the job site, you have to be safe. Safety first, this is one of our meetings. We have daily safety meetings before work starts. We get together and go over the day's plan for the day, what's gonna happen, what's needed, do we have everything we need? Do we have all the safety supplies, extra equipment? Do we know where the AED is? We actually have an AED device in the tunnel with us. Um, that's every day we have one of those safety meetings. Which is, a good, which is good, because when we first got there, safety was not a priority. The guys on the left, that's a drum, 55 gallon drum of diesel fuel that they're rolling down the street. <laughs> so the picture below is the soon after where they were fueling up one of the generators with diesel fuel in the back of a pickup truck. It caught fire, which was bad enough. A couple people almost got run over by the guy in the pickup truck trying to get out of there because he had four drums of diesel fuel in the back of his, of gasoline in the back of his truck. It was at night, it was dark. So that's something, this was early on at the job site, so things have gotten better since. Okay, this is the, um, an, a view of the dam, part of the maintenance grouting program. The grouting programs that they've been doing for 30 years, they've been pumping cement under this dam to fill the voids, they've been using 30 year old equipment, 30 year old technology, and 30 year old supplies. So they broke it down into critical areas. So it's critical area, critical area one, two, and three. Can somebody tell me what they noticed about the critical areas? It's the whole it's dam. It's the whole dam. <laughs> the whole dam is basically a critical area. Some more critical than others, some critical for different reasons than others. Some are on the surface, some are underneath the dam. Okay, this is our, this is our Bible. It's the maintenance, grouting, and rehabilitation on the bottom outlet. Uh, method statement, this is put out by the company. We QC it, they give it to us, we go through it, make sure we approve of it, then they, we sign off on it and they print it out. It's 40 pages and every couple of weeks there is an update. They don't always tell you what they updated, so now we're working to like get numerical um, timestamps on each update so we know what's new. The project has kind of been evolving since you've been there, so a lot of things have changed in the way we do things. So what we're doing is drilling. On the left is the top of the dam where they're drilling down the crest. In the bottom is one of the drills is actually that's the tunnel that's underneath the dam. They're drilling holes down into the dam. The Iraqis have been doing this for 30 years. We're doing it with better equipment and better uh, methods. But basically what the whole maintenance program is, they drill down up to 150 meters below the dam and they pump grout in that hole and they pump until they get a refusal pressure, cap it off, move to the next hole. There's 
So it's a three kilometer dam. The holes are one and a half meters apart, upstream and downstream. So there's a lot of grouting to be done. This is the maintenance grouting. If, um, let me let's show you this real quick. So this is, this is the dam. If you look right about here, there is a tunnel that goes into the dam that meets up with the tunnel that goes under the dam. It's called the grouting gallery. This is the grouting gallery entrance on the left. That's me standing there on the right. That's where we go into work every day. We park our cars and we walk over a kilometer to get to our job site. Nice and cool in there. It's been in the 70s. Outside, it's been over 100 every day, up to 107 when I left. Down in the gallery, it's about 75 degrees. It's, it's humid, where outside it's not humid at all, but I'll take being in the gallery and being on the crest. Okay, that's the tunnel I work in every day. That's the grouting gallery. On the right, you'll see these other lines bringing in grout, bentonite, water. Um, this would be, it's reduction, so there'd be two of each. This is a water line where when we drill, they have to use water because you're drilling through the rock and the grout. If you don't have the water, the drill bit would clog up. So you need water to flush it, so you're constantly flushing the hole. That water is pumped out of the hole, and then it's pumped to a sump, which is then pumped to the next sump, next to the next sump, and the last sump pumps it out. In the New Yorker article, the, the author said that there was water coming in the dam all over the place, and that he thought like, the dam was leaking. There was a little bit of leakage, but nothing major into, into the dam, into the gallery. All the water he saw was from drilling. So it's funny, you read an article about something you know about, and they don't always get it 100% right. This is some of the equipment we have there. If you see that big reel with, um, with the PVC hose, the, the blue tank in front of it is where they pump the grout into and they mix it. It's the final mixing stage of the grout where they combine the cement and the bentonite and the water. It's pumped through that PVC hose to the top of the hole. And here's what they do. First one, the first column, they, they drill down, they install a standpipe, something that we can attach to, the, the equipment. They'll drill all the way down in the second column through every layer down to whatever the design depth is. It's 70 meters or 100 meters, depending on where that layer, those layers I mentioned before where the most uh, dissolution has happened, that's where we want to get to. So what they do then, they'll insert that PVC pipe, so say that's a 100 meter hole, they'll insert it PVC pipe down to 95 meters, there's a packer at the end. The packer inflates through water pressure and seals off that drilling hole. Then they pump grout in there, so the grout can't get back up the hole. As they're pumping in grout, it fills in the different cracks and fissures and cavities and caves until eventually um, the software will show that the pressure starts going up. Because as you start running out of space to put the grout, you keep pumping it, you're gonna get a higher and higher pressure. Different design depths have different refusal pressures. When you hit that refusal pressure, you release it, the packer, you bring it up five meters, you reinflate it, and do the same thing again. So going up step by step by step, you go up five meters at a time, eventually you get to the top of the hole, and hopefully you're done. We've had a rocky hole where we were drilling, and the workers were trying to tell me that the drill rods dropped. Like, that, that, no, that didn't happen. It was, yeah, you drilled to 60 meters, where are the rods? Well, they're at 90 meters. So this was a hole that the Iraqis had grouted for 30 years. We drilled down to 60 meters, and it, accidentally the driller opened the clamp on the machine that let go of the drill rods. They shouldn't go anywhere. They should be sitting at the bottom of the hole. They dropped 30 meters. There was nothing there. The grout that they were putting in the ground had washed away. What they were doing is they were attaching their pipes to the top of the hole and just pumping from there. So as the grout was coming down, it was meeting a lot of water pressure that was pushing it back up. So they were getting the back pressure, but that was because of the grout pushing against the water, not the grout filling the cavities. So they weren't filling a lot of the bottom of the dam the way they thought they were. So this is the T-grout software that we use. Uh, hard to see that schematic, that's from the uh, method statement. Basically, the, the mixer is hooked up to the software and we can see what pressure they're actually working under. So we can see how much grout they're pumping into the ground, how fast it's going in, and what the pressure is. There's nice graphs going by. When we have a red line, refusal pressure, when we hit that red line, we stop, 
we pull up, go to the next step. It's based on Wi-Fi communication. They are hardwired, so if we, a Wi-Fi goes down, it's not always a problem. But there, if the guy running this machine can't communicate with the guy in the control room, there are issues with that. Okay. Okay. So basically, we have to pump at a certain pressure. So that's a graph of effective pressure versus depth. So what happens to the pressure the deeper you go? The pressure gets higher. Not only that, but when we started back in October, we had the reservoir level at 290. Now it's at 310. So that's a, hell, a lot more water pressure on top of the regular pressure. So that's one of the holes that we drilled. Uh, we haven't grounded it yet. We capped it. There's water pressure pushing out the groundwater. You open up the valve and the water shoots out. One of the workers took the opportunity to uh, cool off. Yeah, some of the holes, the sustained pressure would keep the, just the water flowing out of the hole. So that's kind of the water pressure we have to push back against to get grout in the ground. This is some more pictures of the grouting pipes. This is the, uh, the grout setup where they hook that up to the top of the hole that we grouted. They run the pipe down 100 meters, 150 meters, and they start pumping. A lot, of, a lot of fall hazards there, a lot of trip hazards, a lot of things you could slip on. Also, in the original picture, you saw how the valley wasn't flat. So you're walking down slope, up slope. They're securing drill rigs on slopes that they drill, and they have to make sure they're at the right angle. These are some of the pictures of the connection to the drilled hole. The first one shows just a little bit of water coming out. That's not a problem. Uh, instead of the reel of hose, they also use what's called a packer puller. It's two meter lengths of pipe that they send down, screw the next one on, send it down, hook up the um, the grout line to that and pump the grout into the ground. Sometimes the grout bypasses the packer. If the packer is in rock that's not, well, the rock down there is not the best rock always. You don't always have a tight seal. So you'll be pumping, the pressure will increase and the grout will bypass that packer. It'll blow past it. So what they do in that situation is they'll deflate the packer, raise it up a meter, try again. We've had holes that gone up to 30 meters 35 meters in length because you just couldn't find anything for the packer to push up against enough to seal the hole. That's the case, part of the meta statement. We do what we can, we finish it. Eventually, within, after 24 hours, you have to go back and redo that hole. So there's a lot of repetition on some of these uh, situations. This is some of the work that we do down there. This is some of my coworkers on the top left. They're looking at the software. They're looking at the graphs. A lot of times you'll see in that situation I just mentioned, you have the pressure will build up and then the grout blows past the packer. So now your graph will be going up, it will drop, but your flow rate will be going lower. All of a sudden your flow rate spikes. So you have no pressure building up, you have lots of flow, the grout's getting out somewhere. Like I said, the holes are 1.5 meters next to each other. Sometimes you'll be pumping grout into this hole, it starts shooting up down the hole, down the tunnel. So you have to cap that hole, and which is Okay, sometimes, but we just grouted that hole last week. It should be done. There shouldn't be connection, but there is. That's another hole we have to go back to. On the upper right is a gentleman. He's watching the, the manifold, it's called. It just shows your real-time uh, pressure gauge on the pressure and the flow rate. On the left is the BGU. That's the batch grouting unit. That's where they, the final mix is done, so we have to monitor that. Uh, on the bottom is one of the drill rigs. You can see it's a tight spot with the drill rig up and running. We have to squeeze by that. So you have to have a lot of communication, which with the language it is difficult, but eye contact and just stop and, you know, hand signals always works. Well, usually works. As you talked about, we do a lot of QA testing also to make sure that the mix is the right density. We use a, a mud balance to uh, make sure we have the correct density of the mixes. We have different mixes. We had an A mix, which was very thin. We got rid of it. We thought it was too thin. We now have the B and the C. The C is denser. It has to be within a certain range, or they have to remix it or add more material to it. We also test viscosity for resistance to flow. Can't be too thick. Can't be too runny. And we also check temperature where I'm working. Not much of a problem. Up on the crest, you can imagine, everything heats up. We've had batches that we had to cool down because they've gone over 40 degrees Celsius. So when I left, 
uh, two weeks ago, about a week and a half ago, they were working on a cooling system, trying to figure out some way to keep the mix cool before we can use it. So where we're at right now is uh, we have in the gallery, we have over 440 holes grouted completely, up to 150 meters deep on some of them. We have eight operational drill rigs going at uh, any one time. 12 BGUs typically have eight to 11 operating at a single time. We have, like I said, we're working in the very valley now. We have artesian water flow. We have up to eight bar of pressure and 180 liters per minute of water coming out of some of these holes. That was the picture with the water with the gentleman's face in it. Um, we have not a whole lot of guys to supervise. We're running around a lot trying to get different information, but we do rely on the Iraqi workers and the Italian engineers. At first, there was a lot of pushback and, you know, cultural and language barriers, but we're working through all that and things are running a lot smoother now than they were before. You can see here also, the ward is coming up to about here and that hole. So one more thing that we, they worked on was the spillway. This is the spillway, which uh, before the water overtops the dam, it'll come out the spillway, but it hasn't been operational because they haven't had the cranes working to lift up the gates of it. So as part of this project, they also refurbished the, uh, the spillway, and they had some release, which was something to see. I'm standing not too close to it there. I did have a video of it, but it was a, you know, it's like Niagara Falls, the amount of water going across it. Very impressive. These are some of the workers on the Mosul Dam Task Force. In the upper left, it's um, the guy with the yellow hard hat works for the Ministry of Water Resources. He's one of the people that we're training because when this project's done, the, the grouting doesn't stop. This dam was designed to be built continuously grouting. We're giving them new methods, new materials. They're going to have to continue it. So we're training him to continue when we leave. The other two gentlemen with him and me are, um, they're both geotechnical engineers. This is one of the Kurdistan workers, tries to teach me Kurdistan every day. It's not an easy language to learn. One of my co-workers, for some reason, one of the Iraqi workers brought a chicken into work. Never really got an answer why they had a chicken in work that day, but we got a nice picture of it. The, the middle picture on the bottom is more ministry workers that we're training. And these are two of my colleagues from the Army Corps of Engineers who were, this was their flight out. They were there for six months. Then they rotate out. My commitment so far is a year. I'm on my second R&R, &R, so I get to come home for two weeks. I go back on the 23rd. Probably won't be back until, well, in August I go to Spain for my next two weeks, so that's not bad. But the project will go until at least December or January, and then they're talking about actually extending it because they really need to train everybody on the project. Okay, I guess we open it to questions.